Good evening. It is very good to be here with you tonight. I've been looking forward to this for a while. It's been several years since I have actually been able to attend this event. I was chosen to fill in for someone uh, 10 or 12 years ago, and after that, I was never invited back again, and so I wasn't sure what that was about. I was listening to Glenn talk about uh, being married for many years and laying next to his wife in the bed, and I thought about that, and uh, Sherry and I were laying next to each other in the bed recently, and I reached over and I grabbed her on the leg and I squeezed her leg and she didn't flinch. And I squeezed it again and she didn't move. And after a minute, it occurred to me, I'm squeezing my own leg. <laughs> and then that explained why it was so hairy. <laughs> but um, one of the many challenges of um, my new situation. I will admit to you tonight, my topic, the current state of the church and the future state of the church was somewhat challenging, but I want to begin by reading you an excerpt from an article by a religious writer by the name of Dan Foster. This article is dated 2020, and it is entitled, The Church Must Change or It Will Die. It begins this way, abandoned church buildings have become such hot property for wannabe home renovators that there are entire websites dedicated to their sale. And why not? According to online publication, The Christian Century and the USA, an average of nine churches per day shuts their doors for good. It is a fact. The institutionalized Christian church in the West is dying. So what do we make of the evangelical exodus? At this time, we may be tempted to do one of two things. We could throw up our hands in despair and meek, meekly surrender to the tide of our changing culture, or we could redouble our efforts and persist with a model of church that is decades past its used by date. So what are we to do? Then he goes on to describe, this man is not a member of the Lord's church. He goes on to describe what we need to do if the church is going to survive. He says the new church, as he describes it, needs to have certain characteristics. Listen to these. Number one, he says the new church should be focused on social justice. Helping the poor and oppressed is actually one of the key themes of the Bible, he says. Number two, the new church must build bridges, not walls. That sounds good. What does he mean by that? He says we need to be welcoming and embracing the LGBTIQ plus community. L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transgender. I, I don't even know what I stands for. Q I think is supposed to be queer and then plus. That is in case we've forgotten anything. He said we need to be welcoming that. He said we need to be dispensing with prejudice against women in all its forms. We need to acknowledge that we do not have a monopoly on the truth and we need to recognize that there is value in other belief systems. Next, he said the new church needs to be environmentally conscious. Christians, he says, were called by God to care for and protect the earth. We should be leading the way to respect environmental activism. Now, I'm not going to read you the whole art, uh, article. I'll send it, to if you, send it to you if you want to see it. But brethren, this is the world that we live in. When we think about the church today, this is what is around us. Now, of course, this man's not a member of the Lord's church, but in the last two or three decades, we've had some members of the Lord's church that are saying similar things. This man started his article by saying, if the church doesn't change, it will die. He concluded his article by saying, if the church doesn't change, it will die. We've had members of the Lord's church that have said that, have we not? If the church doesn't change, it will die. Is that a true statement? If the church doesn't change, it will die. For decades now, the word change has kind of been a buzzword in the Lord's church. In fact, it has become a, uh, almost a bad word amongst conservative brethren because some individuals that have called themselves change agents have been saying if the church doesn't change, it is going to die, and they have set about to change the Lord's church. And because of that, sound brethren ran away from change. It got to the point that we were opposed to almost anything that was new. 
I remember when I first started preaching, and I think I'm one of the youngest preachers on this program, but when I first started preaching, I remember we didn't have PowerPoint. And so if you were going to do a presentation, you would have an overhead projector and you would have a sheet of wax paper and a wax pencil. Y'all remember these? And anyway, when PowerPoint started coming along, some churches had it and some churches did not. And so I remember I was going to do a gospel meeting in the Nashville area and I called ahead. I spoke to one of the elders and I said, uh, do y'all have PowerPoint? And he said to me, Brother Blackwell, we don't do that liberal stuff here. Well, there's nothing liberal about PowerPoint. It was, just, it was just new, it was just different. I remember the same thing being said when some congregations started using uh, overhead songs. In fact, where I was preaching at the time, we were gonna get the paperless hymnal. I remember some of the brethren complaining. I want us to consider this idea tonight. This man has put forth, if the church doesn't change, it will die. We're talking about the church today and we're talking about where it will be tomorrow. If the church doesn't change, it will die. Is that a true statement or is it not? I want to tell you the answer is yes and no. I want you to hold that before you go into panic mode. I want to talk about this tonight. I'm going to give you two points, maybe three, depending on the time. Number one, I want to talk about some things that cannot change. First, I'm going to make a general statement and then I'm going to get more specific. The general statement is we can't change anything that is doctrinal. When we talk about change, the Word of God doesn't change. John 12, 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The message that Jesus spoke in his lifetime will be the same unchanging message that will stand on the day of judgment. It's not going to change. We cannot change it. We better not change it. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The gospel of Christ will not change. And the Lord is very serious about this. Galatians 1 and verse 8, Paul said, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. We cannot change it. Now that's the general statement. Now I want to get more specific what do I mean when I talk about doctrinal things that can't change? Number one, we can't change the concept of the one church. Some today, even amongst us, are saying that if we're going to survive, we've got to change. We have to be more inclusive. I want to read you, and like this article I read at the beginning by this man who's not a member of the church, he said, we need to recognize we don't have a monopoly on the truth. We've got to be more inclusive or we will die. I want to read to you this quote from a member of the Lord's Church, a man who purports to be a gospel preacher. I took this from a sermon and I copied the text. He said, I want you to get used to being with a lot of Christians because in spite of what some of my brothers think, I think there are going to be a ton of folks that God is going to give grace and mercy to. I don't think it's going to be a small crowd. In speaking about Jesus' prayer for unity in John 17, that all the disciples would be one, this brother said, there are two odd things about the request made by the Lord. He said that they all may be one. Will you say it with me? That they all may be one. The problem is when we say the word we. What if we were at a gathering where the people sitting next to you did not go to the church of Christ? Now they believed in Jesus. They loved the Lord. They are not, however, fellowshipping in a building that says Church of Christ on it. Free up your minds for that bizarre possibility. Brethren, he was saying, if we don't change, we're going to die. We've got to be more inclusive. The problem is, we don't have the right to change the one church. It's not our church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised, upon this rock I will build my church. Singular. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, we are told that the church is the body. The church of Christ is the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body. The church is the body, and there's one body, there's one church. And 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 says the members of that body are to speak the same thing and to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. We can't change the concept of the one church. Number two, we can't change the plan of salvation. I guess at the end of nearly every sermon that I have preached in 27, 28 years I've been preaching, I always conclude with the Lord's invitation. I wish we would still do that. I see a lot of younger preachers not doing that anymore, and some older, but we always end. Sometimes quickly, sometimes in more detail, we need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. 
That's the gospel plan of salvation. We can't change that. Listen to this quote by another man who purports to be a preacher in the Lord's church. He says, Jesus doesn't say that the obedient may be one, that the church of Christers may be one. He prays for those who will believe in him. I tell you what, in order to preach the text, we cannot get into this lesson without appreciating the fact that Jesus asked that we would throw a calf rope around, listen to what he says, all of those who just believe. He says as long as they believe, that's all that matters. The problem is we can't change the plan of salvation. Galatians 3.27 says baptism puts a man into Christ. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10 tells us that salvation is in Christ. You've got to be baptized into Christ, wherein is salvation. 1 Peter 3.21 tells us baptism saves us. I could spend a long time on this point, but I have a lot of points. Next, we can't change the organization of the church. God said the church is to be organized with elders who lead, deacons who serve, preachers who preach. Those elders must meet the qualifications laid out in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. We can't change those qualifications. I'm afraid sometimes, though, we're lax on these qualifications. I'm afraid sometimes we add some qualifications. A woman cannot be an elder. There must be at least two elders. We can't have evangelistic oversight, although I could tell you some stories about that even right now. I won't for the sake of time. Next, we can't change the worship of the church. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, according to the truth. That worship consists of five acts, singing, preaching, prayer, giving, the Lord's Supper. We must partake of these acts every Sunday. We must partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday, Acts 20 and verse 7. We cannot change that. There's been a tremendous push to change the music of the Lord's church. God asked for a cappella, that is, singing only. Let me give you another quote from a brother. He says, my commitment is to God's word and doing things as effectively and biblically as I can. For that reason, I don't go around the country preaching against instrumental music. I go around the country preaching for praise and singing because some things are not very important. God said we must do it this way. He said it's not very important. And so some congregations have gotten to the point now they have two worship services. They have one that's traditional, one that is a cappella, that is the traditional for the old stodgy people. And then the second one that's contemporary, and they'll have instruments and praise teams. And what it amounts to is they are interested in pleasing men instead of pleasing God. God said, give me this, and they say, no, we'd rather have this. We can't change what God has said about female preachers. I got a message from a lady this week. She said they were traveling. They stopped at a church of Christ. They went in. And a man and a woman got up to lead the prayer at the beginning of the service. And she was sending me a question about this. This is a growing trend. Of course, it's a violation of 1 Timothy 2.12. I want to read you this article. This is from May the 9th, 2018. The man's name is Steve Gardner. The article is entitled, Most Church of Christ Colleges No Longer Exclude Women from Leading in the Worship Services, A List of Schools and Their Approach to Chapel. I'm not going to read it all to you. I'll send it to you if you want it. It says, seven of the 12 national and regional colleges affiliated with Churches of Christ no longer exclude women from actively serving in chapel worship services when men and women are both present. Four of them, Abilene Christian, Lipscomb University, Pepperdine, and Rochester College, do not exclude women from any role in the chapel worship services. Women preach, read scripture, lead prayer, and otherwise actively serve in chapel services that include men and women. Three other schools, Lubbock, Oklahoma University and York College no longer generally exclude women from actively serving in mixed chapels, but some exclusivity remains, at least in practice. Women serve as featured speakers and also actively serve in other roles. It goes on to say, these seven colleges are joined by a growing number of Church of Christ congregations that have lifted all or most restriction on women serving in the worship service. This can be a whole sermon. We don't have the right to change what the Bible says about reverence in the worship service. We're being told today, when we come together to worship the Lord, we should dress down. People like that better. People might like that better, but it's not about the people. It's about the fact that I'm presenting myself before God. I don't have the right to change what the Bible says about morality. I can't change what it says about modesty. Brethren, we've gone a long way down this road. 
Many congregations of the Lord's people don't preach on this. They don't preach. If they do preach, they preach apologetically. They preach so generically, people don't get it. We've so redefined modesty that you can't tell the difference in Christians and people of the world. 1 Timothy 2 9, Matthew 5 28, still read the same way. We're still going to be judged by them. With regard to morality, we can't change what the Bible says about drinking. You know, when I was growing up, I can't recall ever hearing members of the Lord's Church defending drinking alcohol. I'm sure there were some out there, but I, I don't remember hearing it. It's extremely common now. It's coming out of Christian colleges. Ephesians 5.18 still says, do not be drunk with wine, which literally is an inceptive verb marking the process. It means do not begin the process of getting drunk with wine. We can't change what the Bible says about homosexuality. Now, Glenn talks some about this. You know, it's strange we have to talk about this so much. In 2015, when the Supreme Court made the decision that homosexual marriage was going to be the law of the land, my daughter Macy was a student at Fried Hardman College, and I called her and I talked to her about this, and she said, Dad, there's a lot of students on campus that support uh, this homosexual marriage. And I said, Macy, that's not right. I said, I don't believe that. Not, not at Fried Hardman. And she said, Dad, I am here. I am telling you this is right. I later talked to Brother Dan Winkler, and I said, Brother Dan, my daughter said so-and-so. And he said, yeah. It, he said, that's right. And I got to thinking about this. What is the age of students at Fried Hardman, 18 to 22? What's been going on in our country for the last 25 or 30 years? If you're 22 years old, what have you had your entire life has been told to you? I pulled some stats, Pew Research polls. It said that 62% of Americans, actually this is 2017, 62% of Americans in 2017 supported homosexual marriage. You think it's higher or lower now? It said this, it broke down support for homosexual marriage by generations. The silent generation, that is 1928 to 1945, I'm just curious, who falls into that category? 28 to 45, okay, a few people. 41% support homosexual marriage. The baby boomers, that's 46 to 64, who is that? That's a, a lot of people here. That's 56%. Generation X, that's my generation, 65 to 80, who's that? 65, and then the millennials, I won't ask you, 1981 and later, 74%. Notice the trend, 41%, 56%, 65%, 74%. Do you notice the trend of this? And what is really shocking, when you look at the baby boomers and Generation X, their support went up 10% just in one year from 16 to 17. Brethren, here's my question. How long is this going to be before we're fighting this in the Lord's church? How long before these are elders and gospel preachers in the Lord's church? 74% of the baby boomers say that this is an okay thing. I was sitting in a Bible class in the Lord's church and a sister raised her hand and she said, you know, we've always been told that homosexuality is wrong. And she said, we always cite Sodom and Gomorrah, but she said, the Bible doesn't say Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of homosexuality. She said, this is what the Bible says. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, look, this was the sin of Sodom. She and her daughter had pride and fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. She said, we've been told one thing. This is what the Bible says. I was actually stunned at the moment. You know the answer to almost every false doctrine is right in the context, almost always if you look at it. If you keep reading, the next verse says this, and, what does that mean? There's more to this story, and they were haughty, and they committed abomination, therefore I took them away as I saw good. When it says, and they committed abomination, do you know what that's talking about? Do you know what homosexuality is called multiple times in the Old Testament? It's an abomination. Do you know what this verse tells me? It teaches me there's a process to this. You don't have a nation or a city one day fears God and the next day embraces homosexuality. What he says is they were prideful. 
That is, they're full of themselves. Then they had fullness of food. They're rich and they're content and abundance of idleness. They've got time on their hands. They didn't strengthen the poor. and They, they didn't care about anybody but themselves. Then they're haughty. Then abomination occurs. Then they're okay with it. Then they embrace it. There's a process. I would ask this, where are we as a country? I don't mean the Lord's church. As a country, are we prideful? Do we have fullness of food? Do we have abundance of idleness? Have we gotten to the point that we don't care about, we're just concerned about ourselves, and I couldn't be bothered to oppose evil because I'm comfortable. Have we embraced homosexuality? Brethren, it's the law of the land. I don't know how we couldn't say we have it. Just this last week, the San Francisco Gay Chorus, there is such a thing as that, they put out a song I don't know if y'all have seen this. I saw it. I went back to look at it yesterday. It's gone now. It was on YouTube. I want to read you some lyrics from this song. The San Francisco Gay Chorus put out a song that says, You think we're sinful. You fight against our rights. You say we all lead lives you can't respect, but you're scared. You think we'll corrupt your children if our agenda goes unchecked. Funny, just this once, you're right. And then they enter a, a, a phase of the song in which they say, we're coming for your children, we're coming for your children, we're coming for your children. San Francisco Gay Chorus. It was there until just a few days ago, and now it's gone off of YouTube. I looked it up. It said that they have made it private now. There are things we cannot change in the Lord's Church. i got to pick up my pace here. There are things that we must change in the Lord's church. Now, what do I mean? What things must we change? Brethren, I want to suggest to you, number one, that we've got to change our methods. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm the director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network. We are an organization that has as our entire goal to use every means of modern technology to reach people with the gospel. Now, what's my point? My point is technology is not bad. Change is not bad in this area. In fact, I think it's essential. Brethren, I believe God has providentially allowed us the incredible means of modern technology so that we can reach people with the gospel. On the day of judgment, if we stand before God and we say, Lord, we couldn't take the gospel to the whole world, there were 8 billion people. He might respond and say, why didn't you use the technology that I gave you? Why didn't you use the internet? Why didn't you use cell phones and, and uh, uh, apps and, and all of these things? I don't believe that God has given us modern technology so that we can binge watch Netflix. I think he's given it so that we can providentially carry the gospel to the world. You know, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and I moved back there in 2006 to be their preacher. And we were, I went into the library one day, we were cleaning some things out, and we had in our library some of the old Jewel Miller film strips. You remember those? I don't mean the, the VHS, I mean the film strips. And we had the little projectors. And we were gonna get rid of some of them. And I remember we had an older lady in the congregation, she was almost 90, and she said, we can't get rid of those, we might need those. I said, we're not gonna need those. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna need, them. we had a map in our library that it was, you remember the old maps, the big cloth ones, and you would fold it over, and it was the big map of Moses' journey through the wilderness, and it was an old one we had. I'm pretty sure it was the one that Moses used when he was traveling. Um, I'm kidding, but it was, literally, it was the one that we had there when I was a kid in the 70s. I don't mean one like it, it was the map. Brethren, we need to avail ourselves of modern methods. Churches today need to have a website. It's unlikely that we're going to be found in the yellow pages today. We need to have a Facebook page. We need to digitally record and store and distribute our material. We need to support works like GBN and Apologetics Press. And, and I could go on with the list, World Video Bible School. I'll get in trouble if I start that. But we need to have things such as Twitter, which incidentally, two weeks ago, Twitter shut down GBN's account. We don't know why. We think it's because we had posted something about homosexuality. Then our account was locked. We need to have things such as Instagram. We're building a new app at GBN that we're going to release soon. We're going to call it the Salvation app. It's going to have several sections. The first one is going to be very simple, 
We're going to have videos that teach the gospel plan of salvation, about three of them, very simple. Secondly, we're going to have printed material where you can print off these Bible materials. We might be using the Back to the Bible material that Rob Whitaker uses. Thirdly, we're going to have a section that answers difficult questions such as what about the thief on the cross and all the things people bring up. And then fourthly, we're going to have a section where you can get in touch with a real live person at GBN so that we can study with you. We're going to keep it simple. Why? Because that's how we're going to reach people. We've got to change with things like this. We've got to reevaluate our methods. It is unlikely the days of tent meetings and door knockings are going to work like they once did. You know, every time I say that, somebody says, well, Don, we have door knocking and it works. Then you ought to do it. That's the point. We need to reevaluate and we need to see what's working. Next, we need to change our facilities. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't want to offend anybody when I'm saying this, but have you ever walked into a building and it smelled musty? And you walked over to the tract rack and recently and you pulled out a tract on the hippie movement in Woodstock. And I say that to exaggerate, but just a little bit because it hasn't been long ago that that happened to me is where I got that illustration. Now somebody says, Don, it's not about the building. People shouldn't be coming because of the building. And that's true, it's not about the building. But did you know an old musty building is gonna deter people and our goal is to be effective. We have to keep in mind we are reaching out to a world that is worldly. And maybe the building shouldn't be the factor we know better as Christians, but they're not Christians. We want to be good stewards. We want to do things that help us, not hurt us. We want to be attractive, not repulsive. Number three, we need to change our outreach. What do I mean? We need to change how we communicate. You know, one thing that I have learned, and I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody again, but I have learned in the Lord's Church, old habits die hard. I have learned that in many places, you know why we do things a certain way? I don't even have to tell you. It's because we've always done it that way. We ought to always reevaluate our methods and say, is this still the best way to do it? Is it still best that we spend this much money mailing out the bulletin, or could we email it? We need to be asking ourselves, yeah, something we need to be thinking about today is giving. You know, paper money is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. Checks are rapidly becoming a thing of the past. My daughter and son-in-law told me, Dad, the only reason that we have checks is to give on the Lord's Day. Now, how are we going to deal with that? You know, at GBN, we've been trying to think of other methods so that people can give electronically because otherwise we're going to lose funds. Is the day going to come that we're going to ask everyone to get out their smartphone and make their contribution or pass a credit card swipe that we're going to swipe on the Lord's Day? Would it be wrong? You know, I said that in one congregation, and the preacher came up to me afterwards, and he said, you made me mad when you said that. And I said, why, brother? And he said, because I never heard that before. Well, that's the point. Though. I heard somebody tell me that when checks became a thing, there were some brethren that were opposed to checks because they said a check is more like an IOU. You've given it, but it doesn't actually come out till later. I never thought about that before, but it's interesting. Now, what's my point? We need to constantly reevaluate the things that we're doing. I'm going to skip the third point and move on to the conclusion here. One drifting brother said this. He said, it's an exciting time to be involved in Church of Christ ministry because things are changing. Old habits are being questioned, old tradition. He said, I mean, we've got the most sacred of cows being trodden through butcher shops all over the country in churches of Christ where people are willing to ask questions that would have been heresy even to voice before. And the sad thing is he's right. People are changing things that they don't have any right to change. So let's ask the question, is it true that if we don't change, we will die? First, I don't believe that. I believe the best way to grow is to be true to the book. We need to preach the word without apology. In fact, I believe if we had more hellfire brimstone preaching, I think we'd have more restorations. 
I know that's contrary to our culture, but I think we would have more conversions. We would have more baptisms. We, had, we did two videos recently on GBN. One was baptism, people that baptism will not save. And secondly, what if I die on my way to be baptized? Some people were up in arms about it. We got several baptisms out of it. Why? Because the power is still in the Word. And we can't forget that. Secondly, even if it were true that we'll die if we don't change, we still can't change. I want to ask you all this question. Do you think that the day could come that the FCC could tell GBN, you can't preach on homosexuality anymore or we will shut you down? Do you think the day could come that they will say, you've got to be all inclusive or we will pull you off the air? Do you think that day could come? Not only do I think it could come, I think that it will come. Just yesterday, there was a White House briefing in which the United States government announced intentions to encourage media platforms, such as Facebook and others, to target what it deems as misinformation in an attempt to keep citizens from being exposed to information that the government doesn't want us to hear. Now, they say that relates to COVID and vaccines and masks. That is, they're saying, if we think this is incorrect information, we're going to tell you to stop it. Don't allow it. So today, it's COVID and mask. Could it be homosexuality tomorrow? You know, what we're facing, as I was thinking about this topic, the Lord's Church today and tomorrow, I think because of the nation that we've lived in, we've been tempted to think, this is the worst it's ever been. We, we've never seen anything like this. That's not true. You know, Revelation 2.10, we oftentimes use Revelation 2.10 in the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithfully, Revelation 2.10. Did you know that's not what that verse is talking about? I don't know that it does damage, but Revelation 2.10 is not really communicating be faithful until death. It is communicating be faithful unto death, even if you have to die. What was the context of that? Even if you have to go to prison. Even if you lose your tax-exempt status, even if you die, you're going to be faithful. And I was thinking as I was preparing this lesson that none of these things are new. The persecution, the propaganda by society, the persecution, propaganda by the government, it's always been around. I got to thinking about some biblical examples. Think about the Hebrew midwives, Exodus chapter 1. They're told by the government, weren't they, that they had to murder babies. You think about Obadiah, 1 Kings chapter 18, had to, he had to sneak and hide the prophets of God from a tyrannical government. You think about Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were told by the government they had to bow down and worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel's forbidden by the government to pray. Think about the wise men in Matthew chapter 2, they're ordered by Herod to tell the whereabouts of the Christ child. He was going to kill him. Think about the apostles, Acts chapter 4. They're commanded not to preach or teach anymore in Jesus' name. We could go on and on. The point that I'm making is this is not new. We are not facing anything that our brethren and children of God have not always faced. Brethren, where are we when we face the persecution of today? And the answer is we're in good company. What about the church today? And where will the church be tomorrow? This is where we should be. We should have our focus on what Paul said, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm afraid sometimes we seem to have forgotten that. In the last year, I've thought about COVID and the way some churches have acted, and I'm afraid we've been more concerned about living than we are about living for the Lord. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Do I really believe that? And if I do, it helps me keep my sight on things beyond this life. I've got a different perspective than I used to have because the things that have happened to me in the last couple of years have been hard. And they've made me think that pain in this life is hard. And it's made me think that this, this life is temporary. But you know one of the things that has kept me going? I keep thinking for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that drives me and it motivates me. 
and it's gotten to the point that that's the only thing that I live for. That's what it's all about, to live as Christ and to die his gain. Do we need to offer an invitation tonight? It may be that you are here tonight and your focus hasn't been right. We want to give you an opportunity to make your life right with God. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you need to know that the Bible teaches to become a child of God. You need to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. If you've never heard that and you don't know what, you're ta what we're talking about, let us know and we'll set up a study. Maybe you are here this evening and you're ready to do that. We're ready to assist you. Maybe this evening, as a child of God, you need to ask for prayers, confess sin in your life. We would count it a great honor if we could go to God and to pray on your behalf. Tonight, you have an opportunity. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come? As together we stand and sing the invitation song.